Today we will continue with our abdominal imaging presentations. Dr. Mariana will give us a talk about abdominal hernias. The floor is yours, Dr. Hi, everyone. May I present a little happy new year? Uh, my topic is about hernia. I try to make it as far as possible, so hopefully we'll finish soon. Okay, uh, I'll speak of some types and classifications of the hernia, a simple definition, and I will show you some pictures along the way. As we know, the classical definition of a hernia is the protrusion of a normal viscous, uh, of a normal, let's say, organ from... Uh, it's a protrusion of a of an organ from its normal position. This applies to the external hernias because I'm going to talk about internal hernias and you'll see the difference. A hernia may be reducible, incarcer incarcerated, or strangulated. And I hope you know the difference among these terms. Because a reducible hernia, as the name suggests, it's easily reduced, while the incarcerated hernia, it can be reduced, but the blood supply is intact. While in strangulated hernia, the blood supply is compromised, so it needs emergency surgery, as it might, uh, the contents might go into ischemia and uh, gallery. Regarding the contents, uh, they can vary from anything fat, just mesentery, any bowel, stomach, you know, just pretty much anything. Okay, regarding the types, uh, we have external hernias. These are the hernias that we commonly hear about. We have ventral or anterior abdominal wall hernias, dorsal abdominal wall or posterior, and groin or pelvic hernias. We have also internal hernias and diaphragmatic hernias. Diaphragmatic hernias, I'm not going to cover because they, we, we covered them in the chest uh, part a little bit. I'm, I'm going to speak of the two uh, first uh, types shortly. Okay, abdominal wall hernias, the common ones that we've heard of uh, in the interior abdominal wall are the gastric hernias, paraumbilical, umbilical, lumbar, spagillion. Spagillion is very rare, so we're not going to cover it. And the growing hernias, the common ones, are inguinal and femoral. Okay, so how do you think a hernia is diagnosed, Megan? Clinical. Oh, external. Yes, mainly clinically, uh, by surgeon, of course. Like sometimes by an internist. Uh, sometimes we might need imaging to confirm the presence of a hernia or if there is... Like um, a vague presentation, an uh, imaging is requested and we might find uh, a hernia. So uh, what imaging methods can we use? Ultrasound. ultrasound. Okay. And CT. 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 Yes, mainly ultrasound and CT can be used. Uh, these two are commonly used here with contrast and without contrast. Uh, the general features and what we look for, uh, we know the best diagnostic clue would be the presence of a lump, which usually is present, unless the patient is presenting with, let's say, signs and symptoms of intestinal obstruction. At the time, let's say we can see a, an obvious hernia, so you request a CT or a, an ultrasound, and uh, by chance you find something there. So we comment on the side, the size and the contents and the... Um, and the status of the blood supply, and so on. Okay, so an umbilical hernia. Usually, the umbilical hernias are due to a defect in the umbilicus. Uh, they're common in children, and uh, usually we wait for them to... Sometimes they resolve spontaneously. They give them a chance up to two years, then they resolve. And when they happen in adults, they're common in female due to... Uh, increased abdominal pressure, you know, from <laughs> pregnancy and, and yeah, due to any reason of increased intra-abdominal pressure. There is a high rate of strangulation and incarceration of bowel uh, in the umbilical hernia type. 
The para umbilical hernia, it does not, it occurs either above or below the umbilicus. Uh, in, in a defect, through a defect in the linea alba. And it can be quite large. They're usually related to rectus abdominis muscle divertication. Yeah. Any, any surgery or any procedure that, um, let's say, in, in, make an incision in the rectus abdominis might be, uh, liable for an umbilic, para umbilical hernia. Okay, uh, you see, this is a CT scan of the abdomen, as you can see, an axial section. Uh, up there, there's a defect, and there's protrusion of the bowel. This is an example of a paraumbilical hernia. What's wrong, other wrong with this image? There's an paraumbilical hernia, okay. What else? There's intestinal obstruction as we have uh, dilated bowel as well. So why does that intestinal obstruction happen? Is it related to the hernia or not? Yes. Not maybe, definitely. Yeah. You said there is a high rate of strangulation, strangulation and incarceration yeah. in what yeah. kind of hernia? Umbilical, not paraumbilical. Yeah. Paraumbilical, uh, rarely in fact. Yeah. But umbilical, which is much rarer, umbilical is much rarer, but it has a high rate of incarceration. So this is an umbilical hernia with incarceration. Okay. However, the 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 you see the marked ascites here. Yeah. The most important finding, in my opinion, here to comment on is this small amount of fluid inside the hernial sac. This is a highly suggestive feature of incarceration. Here you need to make an ultrasound and you put Doppler to see if there's there any blood flow in the bowel loop to rule out strangulation. Is it dead bowel or not? Uh, this is an x-ray of an umbilical hernia. We can see that there is a, an incomplete rim. Uh, it looks like it's protruding out of the, uh, the body, so... Uh, yeah. This indicates an umbilical hernia on an X-ray. Nice. Now, regarding a paraumbilical hernia, uh, you see again this is a uh, CT scan. Uh, above there, up there, there is a defect through which there is protrusion of the of a viscous. But um, as you can see, there are no uh, dilated bowel or any ascites. For me, it looks like more of a divergation of the recti rather than a hernia. See, the bowel loops are within the abdominal cavity, are not yeah, bulging. Maybe, maybe just, yeah. Maybe. Okay. Okay, now this is an ultrasound example of a paraumbilical hernia. We can see uh, these are the recti, so both, and this is a protrusion. I think commonly you see that in practice. Uh, yeah. We saw some cases in this Sure. You see this defect in the linea alba, and you can see fat bulging. Of course, in this case, you press with the probe, trying to reduce it. And when it reduces, you ask the patient to cough or inflate like a Valsalva maneuver or something, and you'll see the fat bulging again to confirm it's a hernia. Okay. Incisional hernia. Uh... We see that commonly in practice, they're due to a breakdown in the fascia, closing prior abdominal surgeries, more common with obesity, wound infection, and smokers for obvious reasons, usually occurs within the first few months after surgery and can be quite large and frequently incarcerated. Uh, they're very common, especially with open abdominal surgeries. We've seen laparotomies, uh, like the gallbladder incisions, and so on. Thanks. Okay, so uh, there is, this is a CT scan, axial and uh, sagittal section. Uh, there's a defect up there. It looks like there's a scar, and we can see a bowel protruding out of there, which indicates a hernia. See here? See, here as well. What do you think the surgery here was? C-section? Most likely. You don't... Or probably hysterectomy. Yeah. I don't see any uterus here. Could be hysterectomy, I don't know. Yeah, uh, 
in the ultrasound, we see a similar finding in mostly all the ultrasounds of a hernia. You see a defect in the muscle and something protruding out of there, as you as it's pointed here. Uh, the indirect inguinal hernia, the surgeons love these indirect direct inguinal hernias. I actually asked a surgeon, I said, is there a significant to knowing indirect versus direct because you will you will operate anyway mm -hmm. so these are just book talk and surgery talks and anyway so it's the most common types of uh, abdominal hernias mostly we see them in males and in children the vast majorities are also indirect we we've heard these talks lateral to the inferior the gastric vessels below and lateral to the tubercle uh -huh. yeah it's just <laughs> Book talks. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Exam talks. Exactly. <laughs> so remember that for the exam. Okay, so this is a CT scan of uh, the abdomen, obviously. Uh, this, th that one is the herniated bowel. This lateral one? to the infer this inferior. One? Yeah. yeah. Lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. Uh, these two are the external inter uh, the external uh, iliac um, artery and vein. Yes, and these because are the these, inferior epigastric. Yeah, and this is the hernia lateral. Too. Good. Okay, so ultrasound actually is very commonly used to examine for the inguinal hernias because it's easily performed and has advantage over the CT because you can ask the patient to change positions and for Volzaba, coughing, standing, sitting, and you can examine accordingly. Uh, as with other types of hernia, you just put the probe and see if there is any defect in the, in the muscle and you see any bulge of the bowel, whether fat or, and etc. Regarding the direct inguinal hernia, it's called direct because it's, it directly protrude, protrudes to Hasselbach triangle. I'm sure we've all heard of that triangle. Uh, it's a defect, it's due to a defect in the transversal fascia. It's medial to the inferior epigastric vessels and they're less susceptible to strangulation as they have a wide neck. Okay, uh, on the CT scan, we see, uh, something called the crescent sign, which is shown here in, in yellow. Now that's the direct hernia, uh, medial to the inferior epigastric vessels. When we have the direct uh, inguinal hernia, uh, it causes a compression over the uh, inferior epigastric vessels, causing a crescent shape. No. So, so uh, all of these represent the inferior epigastric vessels, mm -hmm. and they are compressed by the hernia, mm -hmm. resulting in this crescentic appearance, let's say, you know? Yeah. Nice. Okay, uh, regarding the ultrasound uh, images, uh, same. Uh, this is the inferior epigastric vessel and medial, medial to it. There's a defect, so it most probably due to the. I pre valve maneuver and post valve You We can see uh, how it's enlarged it is. Big bulge, huh? Right. Okay. We have a term called pantaloon hernia, which indicates the presence of both the direct and indirect uh, inguinal hernias. Uh, it's pointed here that this is the inferior epigastric vessels, medial to it. We have the direct and lateral to it, the indirect. So, so this is the common looking, one, the indirect, huh? And this is the, the less common. common one, the direct. Yeah. So it's like two legs of a pantaloon. Mm -hmm. The one? Nice. Okay. Uh, regarding femoral hernias, they're actually pretty rare, seen mainly seen mainly in women. Uh, they they are medial to the common femoral vein and they compress the femoral vein causing engorgement of the distal collateral veins. There, we, we've always heard that they commonly uh, strangulate because it has a uh, short neck, I mean, um, narrow, neck. narrow neck. They're more common in females because of their white pelvis, so they cause... Um, uh, like um, the exit of the femoral canal would be like tight, that's why. Okay. This is uh, an example of a right femoral hernia. That one, yeah. You can see it looks like incarcerated here, yeah. you know. There is surrounding, surrounding fat planes yeah. and, and they are medial to the femoral arteries. And this is an ultrasound image. 
this is the femoral pain, femoral artery, and medial to it, there is a defect with the protrusion of the bowel. Okay, now uh, we had an idea about external hernias even during college time. We don't commonly hear of internal hernias, which is herniation of visceral through mesentery or peritoneum. Uh, the orifices can be either congenital or acquired due to trauma, inflammation, uh, or previous surgery. The clinical presentation would be obviously with the symptoms of bowel obstruction. Uh, Multi-detector CT is the investigation of choice as, as it is internal and we can see it by ultrasound. Uh, we have many, many types of them, but a similar pattern in all would be a sac like uh, cluster of abdom uh, dilated bowel loops with uh, two mesentery vessels in an abnormal location. You suspect that when you have uh, symptoms of bowel obstruction and no obvious um, external, let's say, lump or mass. Okay, uh, so we have, uh, if, like uh, I told you, it's a protrusion through the mesentery or peritoneum. So if it's protruded from a normal foramen, an example would be foramen of men's law, and usual peritoneal fossa or retroperitoneal recess. We have paradudinal, which is the most common type, perisecal and inter intersigmoid hernia, and uh, the others according to the mesentery which they protrude from. So, so basically, in internal hernias are normal bowel loops in abnormal position in the abdominal cavity, not outside the abdominal cavity like external hernias. So they either go through a normal foramen, like foramen of Winslow, for example, or they there's no foramen. There is just a peritoneal fossa or peritoneal reflection or recess, and the bowel loops go there, like the paradudinal or perisical or intersigmoid hernia. Or there is an abnormal opening in the mesentery that the bowel that the normal bowel pass through, like uh, hernia through the omentum mesentery or sigmoid mesocolon. In fact, this all of these are very rare. Yeah. The abnormal opening. Most commonly, it's the uh, paradudinal we see uh, more uh, more frequently. Okay, so these are the approximate percentages of the internal hernias. As you can see, the paradudinal is the most common one, and that's the one that I'm gonna just shortly talk about. So paradudinal hernias uh, are divided into left and right. The left is way more common than the right one. The left occurs through a defect called the fossa of Lanzard, uh, L for left, in the descending colon. So we, we, we usually see it in the left upper quadrant. A classic look, as I said, is a sac like uh, cluster of dilated bowel loops in the left anterior pararenal space with the inferior mesenteric vessel and the ascending left uh, colic artery anterior and medial to it. <laughs> now, we have, these are obvious dilated bowel loops. Okay. Uh, this is a CT, of course. Uh, and anterior and medial to them is the inferior um, mesenteric uh, vein. Okay, so where's the herniated loops? This. But you said it's on the left. This is the right. No, this is the left. No, no, no. Listen, the hernia loops are there okay. somewhere here, and they are obstructed here. Uh, that's why so the proximal yeah. bowel loops get dilated. Yeah. These are not the herniated, okay. it's somewhere here. Okay, and again, here I don't know which where is that. Ah, uh, this is sagittal, I think. Yes, sagittal looks very magnified. Okay. Okay, while well, the right one occurs through a defect called the fossa of Waldier in the ascending column, so it's located in the uh, right lower quadrant, uh, usually we, we see an association with malrotation in this type of hernia. The classic setting would be a uh, non rotated small, small bowel with a uh, normally rotated large bowel. The abnormally dilated small bowel loops are on the right below the third part of the DU and behind the uh, superior mesenteric artery. Okay, we can see here dilated bowel loops and anterior to them is the uh, uh, superior mesenteric artery. Normally, the superior mesenteric artery should be posterior to them. The bowel loops are anterior to the artery, while here they're herniated 
in a posterior position. Nice. Thank you very much.